There we go. Okay. Um, okay. So what we're going to be talking about now is an extension of what we're, we've been doing, um, but specifically talking about agent mobility. So we talked about how agents are embedded within space here. But we haven't really discussed movement of agents. So the model which we looked at for discrete space, discrete time here, um, cells born were born, they live and they die at the same location. We want to ask how to generalize it, okay? Um, so we're going to look at this in continuous space, and we're going to look at it in discrete space. And we're going to look at two different models of each one. Okay, so I had noted earlier that there are two different types of spatial embedding supported by any logic. The first is continuous embedding. The second is a discrete embedding. For the continuous embedding, we had this continuous space discrete. We had these set of cells, like we've just seen with, with the uh, game of life. These map more or less directly onto mobility constraints as well. So when we have a continuous embedding, what happens is agents move in a certain direction with a certain speed, sort of on their, on their own, without any action applied to it. So your pro folks are probably familiar with um, uh, Newton's, I believe it's his first law of motion. Um, you know, unless you exert a force, uh, the, uh, the object will retain its momentum, its inertia. And so if it's in motion, absent a force to stop it, it will continue in motion. If it's fixed, you know, it is not moving uh, with respect to certain directions, it's not going to, uh, to start moving. Here, we can set these objects moving in a certain direction, and without any updates, they'll just continue to move until we stop them. Um, and they'll move with some speed, we'll, we'll tell it. Go at this velocity in this direction, and they'll just move across. And we can be <laughs> alerted when they reach their destination. Okay? There's no physical exclusion here. So two of these objects, if they cross at the same, their, their paths cross, there's no exclusionary principle that will prevent them, that will require them to stop. Instead, we view it as sort of like viewing, you know, Boston from 30,000 feet and you consider two ants crossing. They, they just kind of cross. We don't have to worry that they, that they impact each other in some way and prevent each other from moving. They're assumed to be very small compared to the landscape scale. And they exhibit arbitrary density without, without concern. With discrete cells, by contrast, we have physical exclusion, only one or zero agents in every cell, and agents move continuously or discontinuously from cell to cell. They can move to the next cell over, and in some cases they can jump, as they can in, in continuous space as well, yeah, can jump as well. Okay, so I'd like you to load in wandering elephants, okay? Um, so wandering elephants, uh, we'll, we'll call it up here. Um, so come on, okay, so I may have already loaded it here, come on, um, there it is. <laughs> okay, so wandering elephants is going to simulate, I'm just closing it up so I can open it in front of you, example models, and let's go find this. Um, are we gonna have to, okay, this time it shows, <laughs> it shows all of them. Um, so we're gonna scroll down to wandering elephants and we're going to call up the wandering elephants here. It's loaded down at the bottom. Okay, so the wandering elephants is, if we run it, let's run it down at the bottom here, what it's going to show is a set of elephants wandering over a irregular terrain. These wandering elephants <laughs> consume vegetation. Um, so if we switch to this vegetation mode, what we'll see is that these, there's vegetation on the ground and these elephants go and they trample down and consume the vegetation while the, where they wander. So they denude certain areas of vegetation. Now there's some of these elephants are, are uh, infected and those are uh, shown in red. So they move faster. And, and so those, um, those elephants can infect others. And uh, what's that? 
What's that? Oh, excuse me. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm confused with the CWD model. They're just thirsty, and so they run to water when they're thirsty oh. at great speed. <laughs> so uh, so they, um, uh, they exhibit great urgency in getting there. Um, you, you'll notice that they, sorry? Yes, it is. So here, let's speed it up. Let's speed it up. This is only 32 times. Watch, let's, let's uh, go as, and in fact, we'll s turn to virtual mode. There it is. So it's, it's growing back. The vegetation grows back over time, but it, it keeps on getting eaten. And um, you'll notice that the elephants are trapped in the space. And occasionally, you'll see one hit the bounce bounce off the space um, in sort of a billiard esque way. Um, so uh, you know, like uh, you'll notice they they tend to go in kind of straight straight patterns uh, for a certain amount of time until they get thirsty or until they reach their destination and eat. Um, and they can't cross the water, right? Um, they simply go to the water periphery. Okay, so um, that's the vegetation, and then altitude is determining the, the sort of extent of the vegetation. And you can press this button and get a new landscape if you want to see them in a, in a new environment. Okay, so um, this is our little world uh, that we're going to be analyzing. And you notice, by the way, they eke out these trails that where they've destroyed vegetation, trampled down vegetation right along the way. Um, this elephant is about to bounce. Just bounced and is going a different way, and he's eking out a trail. You see that? He's, he's sort of stretching out this trail as, as he passes, and he's heading for water. Well, he, at least he hopes he is. But okay, he doesn't actually seem to be that well. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, in any event, um, let's go take a look at this model. So this is this is continuous space but it is and it is also I believe oh I'd have to think about this if it's discrete or continuous time we'll have to see this okay so let's go look at the environment for this model so we'll stop the, um, the little game here and we'll go take a look at the environment the environment lives in Maine so um, we'll go check out Maine here and once again, we have to scroll to the left, I believe. Yes, OK. And there we see the, the components. So let's go click on environment. And you'll notice that um, uh, within the environment, if we go to the advanced tab, uh, this is continuous 2D space. So at a certain width and a certain height. And so it's, it's, it's not actually discrete space. However, there is a vegetation uh, a vegetation array that's actually in uh, divides it up into a set of, of 100 by 100 grid here and you'll notice that right there this vegetation um, grid okay so let's go look at elephant so so let's go double click on elephant and you'll notice there's some logic there as described by a uh, by a somewhat uh, textured state chart so um, uh, broadly speaking, there's uh, a couple phenomena associated with this agent, um, with this elephant. Um, there's two broad states. One is go to water, a state where they are heading in a urgent way towards water. And they proceed with that state until they reach water. And then there's a separate one where they're free wandering. And periodically, they establish a new direction so those are two broad states. And what you'll see here is kind of a, a, uh, a hierarchical state, as we saw in another model. Um, so periodically, after a timeout of 12, during the free wandering time, they will start to go in a random direction. Mm -hmm. uh, but periodically, they will get thirsty. And that's based on a quite um, it's based on a uniform draw from a quite complex um, formulation involving, uh, so it's a uniform distribution 
from 80% of their drinking period to 1.2 times their drinking period. So the period between the, when they get thirsty, the average period till they get thirsty. With that timeout, they'll then head for water. So each time they, they come into this state again, this upper state, this get thirsty will be timed to sort of from 0.8, so 80% of their, of their um, drinking period to 1.2 times um, that somewhere in that range, they'll get thirsty after that amount of time. But it'll be a different amount every time. Sometimes maybe 100% of their time between drink, their normal time between drink, sometimes 80%, sometimes 120%. So they'll get thirsty and then they'll go to water. So at the go to water, they mark themselves as thirsty and they will end up going off in a, um, a certain direction. I think we'll look at that in just a minute. Okay, so um, there's, um, right. Uh, so I wanna highlight a couple things. One thing is um, this new direction in the center thing, you'll notice that they pick a new direction going to heading random here. And this head, heading random is a, is a function here, okay? And there's some code associated with it. And the code basically does a couple things. First of all, it stops their current movement, any current movement in which they're engaged. It sets their velocity with a draw from a distribution. And then it initiates movement towards uh, towards a destination. And to do that, they have a velocity. It gets a heading, and it perturbs the heading with a certain random perturbation that will sort of mean it's somewhat <coughs> off, and it moves it towards that. And this is a computation by which it's kind of moving in the direction of that uh, destination. The actual destination is their current location plus a thousand, which is a very large distance in the direction of the heading. So essentially, they're told to move to that to this very distant point in a certain direction, and they just start movement there. And after 12 time units, they will they will finish their movement. So this this um, you'll see this um, little uh, self transition there after 12 time units to move. So essentially they never reach their destination fully. Um, their, their sort of destination in terms of random uh, free wandering movement, they just go in a certain direction. Okay, so that's the heading to, heading to random here. Now um, this get thirsty, you'll notice that it kicked off a heading to water as well, so there's a there's a heading to water here, um, and uh, for heading to water, that's kicked off by getting thirsty, and in heading to water, what it's going to do is try to locate some water, and then try to set the heading to go there, okay, and the distance to go there, and then it sets them at a high velocity. Remember, you, someone had commented that the elephants heading to water go at a high velocity, and it starts the moving in there. So what you see here, without going into all the details, this is grungy sort of code. It should really be separated out. But what you see here is that you're setting your velocity, and then you're setting it move to a certain place, and they start to move towards there. Um, so here they're moving in a direction that will get them to water. Um, towards uh, towards water. Now, this drink water here is received if they receive a mess or is initiated if they receive a message called drink. So that presumably is linked to to um, when they arrive at water. Right now, although it's not used in this model, if you click on elephant uh, the agent tab. So if you click on elephant and you go to agent. What you'll notice is that there's a there's a uh, component here which is called on arrival. See this here. So on arrival would be for many models like this when they arrive at a location for which they set out. This will be triggered and that will wake them up and say, "Okay, I arrived. 
let me now do something here. Maybe it's drink water, maybe it's mate, maybe it's, you know, die or whatever. But this, this would signify your on arrival. You could have it do something at that point. Alternatively, within a state chart, you, you'll notice there's also a trigger, just like there's a timeout, a rate, a condition, and a message trigger, there can be an agent arrival trigger, which is when I arrive at my destination, make this transition in the state chart. Okay, um, okay so um, here, Question. yes. Yes, that's right. And then the Until you get a message that says drink water. That's right. So, so in other words, um, although I'll, I'll, I'll comment that, um, in, in something else there in just a minute. So this state here, you go into this after a certain amount of time, and you're now in this drink water state, right? Um, so in this drink water state, well, bef even before you get into it, you start heading towards some water, right? right? And then once you're in here, you're in this thirsty state, right? Sort of, you're marked as being thirsty while you're in there. And finally, when you get some message that says drink, then, then it will actually drink water and your thirst will be slaked. And then you go back in the free wandering state. Now the question is, where is that that drink message sent. And if we go look at elephant, and we go to the agent tab, and you scroll down, you'll notice that, right, do you see it there? So basically, if you encounter water, and that's determined by the altitude of the current place being less than zero, and you're thirsty, then it sends a message that says drink. Okay? So, so in short, you're kind of going along, and you hit water, and if you're thirsty, it'll send you a message that says drink. And then you go back, and you're sort of freed from this water obsession, and you go back to wandering. Does that make sense? So, so okay. So, say that again. So, help me, help so me understand. Yeah. You know, drink water. Right. Um, access the message. Right. And then get it stated. Right. So every time we get to know where this message was, same. Like set, like, water. Yeah. And like yeah. which age? Which other agent? Oh, just, no, no. Like, oh, like what place? Yeah. Uh, um. Oh, you can visually see. trace the origin. In the code. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what I would do is I would search. It's a good question. Um, so what you can do is you could search in this workspace for, say, drink, or, you know, drink, something like that. And then you can do search. And what it will show you is in these places it is, it is found. So, for example, in the behavior, um, a timeout here, okay, well, okay, it found it there. And you'll notice it's it's finding sort of all variations of it, right? Um, so it found it here. Is that the sort of thing you're yeah. looking for? Yeah, yeah. So you can do that. I just did Control F, or you can do uh, it's under. I thought it was under Edit Find. Yeah, Edit Search Replace. Yeah. Okay. So um, what this is doing is it is telling the so let's go back there so let's scroll down to that so w what's going on here is it's telling the behavior what is behavior here can anyone tell me what's behavior it's it's telling behavior hey receive a message what is behavior what is this thing 
It's a state chart. And remember, that's how we tell state charts to process a message. We're basically telling the state chart, hey, we're telling the state chart to process this message. We're not telling the agent. You would send an agent a message. But if you're sending it, yeah, right. and you could send the agent, you could send the elephant the message, but then the elephant would have to route it to the state chart. This is just mm -hmm. routing it to the state chart directly. This is what we did previously when the agent got a message, you routed it to a state chart using that mechanism. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so this is actually a lot of, of, um, of uh, logic here, which is very messily presented. It could be done much better than this. But the basic gist of it is um, something we'll look at uh, at a, we can look at in more detail uh, later. But here, actually, maybe I have the comments right here. So basically, the first thing we do is we find our location in space in terms of vegetation space, um, sort of in terms of columns and rows. And then we handle the case when they reach water and they're thirsty. And, um, and then they have to route around, oh, then it updates the vegetation. So wherever you're going, you're demolishing trees. So you're, you're walking over these trees and you're demolishing them and therefore you're lowering the amount of vegetation. This minus equals means the vegetation, the current vegetation level is 10,000 less than the previous vegetation level. And and then you have to avoid bounds. You have to route around boundaries in water. So if you hit a boundary, you stop, and then you try to find a new heading. Um, or if you are heading towards water, you have to stop, and you have to find a new heading. And it searches for a new heading here, as long as it keeps on hitting water or, um, or a boundary. So that's the, that's the kind of logic. And then there's some logic associated with update vegetation. Um, so if we go to, if we go to Maine. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. Um, no, no, I mean, it's, don't make code that looks like that because it's all hard coded like, this is minus 10,000, and this is 500, and this is if it's greater than 15, and you, you should not do that because it, that means something. The 500 means something. It's like the width of the space, the length of the space, and give it a name, and, and put it somewhere so it can be modified. And then the code is much more documenting. The other thing is that they should have done here is this, this code is just all it's all crammed together at one place, and it doesn't lend itself to understanding it. So if I go back to that, um, this code is doing many conceptually different things. First of all, it's getting the, the columns and rows associated with the current agent's continuous space. That should be a separate function. Then it's determining if they're in water, and if so, it's slaking their thirst and release them. That should be a separate function. Um, then it's updating the vegetation uh, to, to affect their destruction. You should call a thing that says like destroy vegetation or something like that. And then it should avoid water. And this, it should probably have a check like if um, illegal position mm -hmm. and it hides what this logic is. And then that, that is illegal position could have it, it could it use constants for these things. This is really, like, I don't know what this 100, I, I think this 100 is just an arbitrary limit, but I'd have to double check this 10. You know, why is there a 10 here instead of 11? Um, you really want to be careful. These things are not to be trifled with because they can make the code very confusing to change. Like, sometimes you have in your code 100, and then you have a 99, and are they logically linked? Let's, like may maybe the reason it's 99 is because it's 100 minus one, but maybe it's because of some other reason. And if you should really have like limit e is, is a variable and it's equal to 100 and then you have 99, instead of 99 you have limit minus one. Mm -hmm. And so if you update limit, it'll automatically change. If it's just 99, you don't know. And so you can go update the 100 and you forget to update the 99 and, and you're in bad shape. So this, this code is, is not particularly good. Um, in fact, it's, it's 
I, I urge you not to create code like that. But um, it, it is basically uh, under do, uh, doing the logic for this right now. Periodically, the environment updates the vegetation. So if you go look at main, um, and we go look at the functions in main, there's a uh, update vegetation here. An update vegetation is called, and it's good that they broke this away, and basically what it does is it goes through all the columns and rows. This should again be a better, should be a constant, you know, a, a named constant. And it figures out how to update the vegetation based on the current level of vegetation. And, um, and it basically t says, okay, I haven't yet drawn the vegetation. Where is this called? Well, periodically it's called from, um, I believe it's called from the environment periodically. So here we have the environment. And here on after step, you'll notice it updates mm -hmm. the vegetation. So it calls, the environment is, is responsible for calling it um, after each step. So this actually, this model actually does have steps here. It's periodically doing this update to vegetation. Okay, so I want to just highlight uh, a couple things here. One thing is that within this continuous space, the two most important things you use are move to. So you send an agent in a certain direction with move to, and then you do set velocity. Um, now, you can also get other types of information. You can get x, get y, get their location. You can set x and y, set their initial location. You could jump them to a space. So if you wanted these elephants to suddenly transport, you know, te teleport to another place, you could do so with this. This is agent mobility discontinuously. You can ask, are they currently moving? You can ask, where are they heading to? And you can set their rotation on the screen. So their, their icon moves around in a rotated way. And you can set their current rotation uh, as it's displayed. So this is, these are some additional items. These are the most important two that you'll be likely to use. So um, I mean, one thing we could do here is, um, uh, well, it's tempting, but um, Time, time is short, so I was going to suggest teleporting the elephants, but um, <laughs> tele teleporting them to water. Okay, well you want to you want to teleport them to water? Okay, let's 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 do that. I think we could do that pretty quick, actually. Um, okay, so let's. Uh, how do we teleport the elephant to water? Where do we start modifying this? Where do we look? If we want to figure out how to teleport. How to, where to modify things to get the elephants to go to water quickly. Where do we go? Okay, so the state chart's a great place to start because that actually describes sort of the process of, of, of getting thirsty and so on, right? So where might we look here for figure out where to put it? Where might we look? Okay, okay, so go to water is a great place to look. This sets thirsty, but I would actually say if you if you have this get thirsty, you notice it says heading to water. So let's go to heading to water. So this is a what is this? This is a what? What is this thing? What is it's a it's a call to a method. What it's really telling you is this. It's really telling you this dot heading to water. It's say, hey, head myself to water. Hey myself, head to water. Okay? Let's go look at heading to water. Okay, this is horrible. Um, <laughs> um, okay, but this is where we have to modify it. This is this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the move to. Okay, instead of move to, let's do jump to. Right, right. Okay, so where am I right now? I'm an elephant, and I'm looking at heading to water. And instead of move to, I want to do jump to. This guy here moves the agent to the location instead of move to. Okay, can we do jump to? Are folks okay with that? Now, by the way, bad things could happen. I don't know. I've never done this, but <laughs> but by bad things, I mean like maybe they'll appear in the water or something like that. Like we could have 
elephants that suddenly appear in the <laughs> middle of the water. But let's, let's, let's try it, right? Okay? So by the way, this jump to, what is that implicitly? It's what dot jump to? This dot jump to. It's telling myself, go jump there. Okay. Um, correct. Correct. It just sets you towards that with whatever velocity. Okay, can we run it? Let's just see what happens. I, I think unexpected things may happen. Okay, so, oh, <laughs> root elephant is not moving. Um, okay, uh, okay, so I think what happened is we, ne we never moved them. Mm -hmm. All we did is jump them. So maybe we have to set the moving. Yeah, uh, uh, okay, that's, wait a minute, but you know, they're heading arbitrarily oh, yeah, far in that direction. Oh, yeah. um, so, uh, so that, that's, that's the problem. Tell you what we could do though. Let's change this back to move to, but um, what you could have happen is, um, uh, why don't we just, when we click on the elephant, they'll jump. Mm -hmm. They'll jump. Okay. Um, so where would we go to do that? Sorry? Yeah, the elephant. That's, that's right. So, yeah? Well, they're just, they're just, they're just, they're searching and then, and then they may be off some. They're heading in a different, they may be, their heading may be off as I, as I, as I recall what it says here. Right, right, with perturbation, yeah. So, okay, yeah, so for the elephant, if we wanted to, to double click on it and, and have it jump, where would we have to go here? We'd have to, yeah, this icon and we'd have to handle it in dynamic, right? And then on click, we could have it jump to, how if we have it jump to something close to the current position? Like, you know, this dot get X plus uniform, something between, I don't know, minus 50 and 50. Um, don't do this. <laughs> this is purely to sort of illustrate the, the principle. Um, okay, so all I'm doing is uh, I'm jumping to a place that's around me, but it's perturbed by between 50 to left and right and 50 up and down, right? Does that make sense? Okay, okay. So that's all I'm doing. And then I'm going to try running this thing. Let's run it. Okay. Uh, oh, it's giving me some trouble. Let's go see. Oh, it needs a it needs a semicolon. Okay, at the end. Okay, so we're gonna try this and try running it. And there we go. Okay. Okay. So let's see. No one's gotten. Okay. So there we go. Okay. So now if we click an elephant. Okay. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> come on. <laughs> Okay, I, th I think I exhibit one exhibited perturbation. Um, okay, uh, come on. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, it, did it, yeah, oh, okay, not moving. Um, so I was able to get it to do something um, adverse. Um, Okay, yeah, so I think, I think actually that did, but one thing we could do is we could put a trace LN in, right? It said uh, I was clicked, and yes, we could change the color. Uh, well, okay, um, we don't want to get too advanced. Um, uh, we'd have to insert probably a, a color variable or whatever. Um, and, okay, so, so I'm just, come on. Oh, yeah, yeah, I teleported him. Okay, yep, he teleported. Okay, yeah, and then sometimes it disturbs their movement and it causes distress. Um, 
Okay, yeah, I was clicked, I was clicked. Okay, so um, why did it cause that problem? Well, somehow it, it got in the way of their um, movement. I think maybe... I think maybe it stops the flag or you know, resets the flag and the flag is used for heading forward or something. Yeah, it's not, not clear to me what... Um, what happened about why it stopped it, why it was no longer moving. But in any case, um, let, let, let's go on to the next thing, though. Um, okay, so let's go on now to the final class, which is uh, of, of these sort of models, which is the shelling segregation model, okay? Um, so this is a model of the emergence of segregation, um, which is very stylized but showing how very slight preferences can in some cases lead to um, big patterns in terms of segregation of different communities. So we're gonna have to do help example models and we're gonna have to scroll down to the shelling segregation model, okay? So uh, it is here, shelling segregation. Now, this model is discrete space, but agents move. So it has some, it looks a little bit like a cellular automata model. So let's run this thing. Um, but agents are actually moving around. Um, and what you'll see here is that, um, let me close this thing back here. Um, so agents here have a preference to be, a, somewhat of a preference to be near people like them. And the preference can vary in terms of its strength. So here's a preference, this is a, uh, what it describes as a 51% as a preference. 0% um, uh, preference would be, um, uh, a 50% preference, I think, is actually a, I'd have to go double check the logic. My recollection was a 50% preference is no preference at all. 51% uh, is, a, is a slight preference. Um, and what you'll find is that depending on the degree of preference, you'll see these macro patterns emerging, which are not deterministic, but which exhibit sort of these broad regularities of people next to each other. So, so here you have sort of this uh, state where people are searching for positions and occasionally it will settle down. It'll settle down to a position which is stable and where people are generally comfortable with where they're at. If you, if you bump it up a bit, it may stay stable or it may not remain stable. And if it goes far enough up, there's never going to be a state it's going to fully, or it'll take a long time to reach a state where it remains stable. So let's just go see what's going on here. And what we're going to see, well, we may have to leave it till next time, is building up some UI elements associated with it. Okay, so let's go look at the environment uh, with an eye towards seeing what sort of uh, positioning is expected here. Okay, so we're going to go to main, go look at the environment, okay, um, and, and once we're in the environment, we're going to go to advanced, and what, once again, you'll see it's a discrete 2D with a width and height and then rows and columns, so it's a discrete environment, and we have a more neighborhood, so we have four four neighbors, okay. Um, now, I'd like you to go take a look at the, the uh, population here. So the population here is going to set the characteristics, the heterogeneity in the underlying population, and uh, specifically it sets the color. So you'll notice it specifies color here. What is this an indication of? What is color, do you think, that it can set it here, associated with the population? Why is it that it appears here, this color? That's an indication that it's a what? We've seen it before. If the population is defining the color 
for the agents within the population, what does that indicate color is? It's a, per, it's a parameter. It's a parameter of the agent. Remember, parameters are such that when you create the thing that has the parameter, you can specify the value of the parameter. So, so the main class, the main class's populations tells when it creates the agents within that population, you tell it what expression to use to determine the color for that agent. Similarly, when the main class creates, excuse me, when the simulation creates main, it specifies the parameters for main. So here, what this is giving is an expression to use to determine the color for each person within this population, this, this color field. So what is that, can anyone say what does that expression mean? We've seen this random group just about an hour ago. Right. And this is with what percent chance? 50 percent chance. Yeah. So it's an even, even flip. Right. Um, so it just flips a coin as to whether someone's initially red or blue. Right. Um, okay. Um, you'll notice, by the way, this is this color is a parameter here, even though it is being. Uh, excuse me. The agents are moving here, so their color is not going to be changing. That's a that's a difference from the model we saw earlier. Earlier we saw a model where the cells had evolving state. Here we have people and the people are gonna move around. Okay, so let's take this up a level and let's take a look at the threshold parameter in main. You'll notice there's this parameter here in main called threshold. Who sets that parameter value, do you think, based on what I just commented? Who sets the parameter value here? Yeah, yeah. So let's go down to simulation. And simulation here is, uh, excuse me, go to, go to parameters here. You'll notice threshold is set, for example, to be 0.7. Okay, um, right there. So um, uh, here we have we have the simulation specifying the value of that parameter there. But we're going to look next time. And I'm going to have to divide this up because we don't have time to cover it all. Next time we're going to look at how we build these UI elements, these user interface elements, to set the value of this threshold interactively. And in fact, you see the, the key elements of it right here. We can actually have it, while we're adjusting it live, adjust the value. OK, so now I'd like you to open person. That will be a sort of a glimpse for, for next time. I'd like you to open person, the person class. And I'd like you to go to look at the person's visual representation, OK? So that's the representation up here. And what you'll find is under the dynamic, the dynamic properties, the fill color is set to be color. So that's just based on, on that parameter, the parameter that was set, you'll recall, at, by, the, by the enclosing population. OK. So, here, what we're going to look at is a discrete time model logic, okay? So I'd like you to go to person, okay? So go to person here, and in person, under agent, there'll be some code here. And this code, once again, matches the basic criteria we, we specified earlier. So it's going to compute an on before step some information based on its own state and the state of those around it and then it's going to update its state based on that information it had previously collected within the on step at the time of on step so when it actually comes time to step 
So here it's collecting some information, and here it's using that information to determine its state. What aspect of its state is it changing within this final event handler? It's, staying, it's changing its what? We didn't see this in that model we saw earlier, the uh, game of life. We didn't see this type of state update, but it's changing its, its position. So I want to draw a contrast here. Forgive me for repeating it. Earlier with the game of life, we had these cells that had fixed positions, and each of them had some state which would change over time. An agent could be born in them, live and die in them. But those agents themselves were not captured separate from the cells. Here we have a situation where we have people who happen to live in certain cells and can jump to empty cells, for example. But they, they move between these cells. And an aspect of their state, an important aspect, is where they live at a given point. So even though they may look similar, they're both on a grid, involve empty cells and non-empty cells, they're quite different in the sense that here we have agents moving between locations, discrete locations. Previously, what we had is um, you know, cells that, that had a fixed location. So yeah. Yeah, really only, even though even you know, threshold is the same, they're really only five on the um, Correct, correct. There, it, it, what you're uh, alluding to, I think, is that there's uh, sort of, uh, for all, um, there's only, functionally distinct is a good way to put it, there's different ranges that yield precisely the same behavior. And within that range, uh, there's not going to be any change because the ranges are defined by what the fraction or percentage, as it were, um, you can view it interchangeably, of your neighbors that are of your same color. And yeah, exactly. So it's, it's either 0% or 25% or 50% or 75% or, you know, uh, or, or all of uh, one. And so whether it's uh, you know, 76% uh, or 77% is, is immaterial. Yes, that's exactly right. And that's a very perceptive comment. Um, so here, though, what we do have is a calculation on on before step. So again, we have this lockstep updating by these agents in this grid. And before anyone updates, they're going to collect information on their neighbors. And what information are they going to collect? Well. They are going to find out who their, who their neighbors are. And when they find out who their neighbors are, the first thing they do is to check if what? What do you think this is checking? If neighbors equals null? Yeah, are there any neighbors? If there's no neighbors at all, it treats the person as satisfied. Okay, so if I'm living with no people around me, I'm treated as good enough. If I do have neighbors, then I'm going to accumulate. You've seen this pattern before. Where did we see this sort of pattern? Um, where we initialized this count to be zero, and then we incremented this count. What is? Yeah, it's a game of life. And basically, what what are we? What is this thing doing here? It's looping over my what? My neighbors, and it's counting up the number that what? that have the same color as me. And what is this thing here where it's doing that person? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's casting it. It was a type coercion or, or casting. So it's treating agent A as a person. This is the same pattern we saw before. Before we had to treat it as a what? In the game of life we treated it as a cell because that was our agent class there. This is our agent class here called persons we have to treat as a person. That's the pattern you see because it doesn't know about color in general for agents, because that color was something we lent this. We could have called it color with a U, as we do in Canada. And then we <laughs> would have said it's not color. Um, so it doesn't know whether you're Canada or US, and so it's not going to automatically know that it's, it's got a color. It's not smart enough. Um, OK, so we accumulate that information on satisfied and 
uh, on, on n same, and then we determine, so if you have no neighbors, this handles that case. If you do have neighbors, you count the number that have the same, the same color as you. What is that method equals? Sorry? What is that method equals? Okay. Oh, of that's asking if this color equals that color. So instead, instead of comparison, could you use comparison? Um, Double. Okay, no. Okay. And, and the reason, okay, so that's an excellent, a simply excellent question. Let me state this, and um, I'm going to have to do some fancy footwork with the time to um, finish this up. Um, okay, so what is this color? What, what is that? Is that a, is that a number? Uh, is it a boolean? What is it? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's actually a reference to a color. Okay, it's a, it's a reference <coughs> to a color. Okay, it's a, or it's a reference to a color. It's not. It's not. A, it's not like a one or a two or a three or three point five and some primitive value number. Um, it's a reference. And if I have two references, let's suppose that I have one color that. That is um, that is uh, red, and I have a reference to it. Okay. Um, I might have created something called red in another case, which is functionally it, it represents the same color. It's called D. Now, if I just say is C equal to D, all it's going to look at is, is this thing referring to the same one as that one? Okay? It's kind of like, um, okay, let me put it this way. It will be as if, uh, what I'm interested in is my car the same type as your car? And if I just said, is my car the same as your car? You'd say, no, your car is a fine car. You know, yours is yours, mine is mine. Um, but what I'm really interested in knowing is, is it, is it the same type of car, is it, or the same um, category of cars? In, in, uh, I'm, I don't care whether it's precisely the same object, I care whether it's the same, functionally the same color that it represents. And there are cases where these might happen to be equal, but you don't want to rely on that. What you want to ask is, is this color functionally the same as that color? Okay, um, that's it's, it's a little bit of a, a hard thing to perhaps think about for color, but um, it, there's no guarantees that if I ask for a red, that it will give me exactly the same referent to red. Okay, um, no more so than if I ask for a taxi in the morning and then a taxi in the evening that's going to give me the same taxi. What I care about is, you know, or do I have a taxi in, in both cases? Okay. Um, uh, so, so here, this dot, um, this dot equals thing, uh, the reason it had that was because, um, let's get, get rid of that. Um, this dot equals is because it's actually testing are they functionally the same color? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, uh, okay. So yeah, I mean, if I if I request redness from the red color class, there's no guarantees it's going to give me the same one, same one. Okay. If if there were, then I w I could just do equals, but but here I can't. Um, okay. Uh, so what we're going to do next time is to extend this, um, but let's let's just take a look at um, how this works a tiny bit more, and then we'll finish up here. Then we're going to add user interface elements to this. We're going we're going to add sort of setting a new slider and seeing how the slider operation works. And we're going to go on to look at input and output. How do you get graphs out? How do you get tables of numbers out? How do you um, create statistics on your populations, et cetera? 
But let's go look at, um, just finish up our look at the logic here. So we had person, and then we had agent, and we scroll down, and here, so here we're determining, am I satisfied? If I'm not satisfied, what am I going to do? I'm going to jump to a random empty cell. Note, note that that's not saying I jump to someone who's like me. I'm just going to jump to a cell elsewhere in, in this space. So if I'm not satisfied with where I am now, that's all determined in the on before step. Everyone across the entire simulation is going to determine are they satisfied. And when on step comes along, those who are satisfied are not going to change anything. But if they're not satisfied and with a 30% probability, kind of flips a coin, 30% probability they're going to jump to some cell somewhere in the space. Some other cell distinct from where they are now. And they're going to try to, some empty cell. And they're going to try to start over. So this jump to random empty cell, where does that come from? That's built into any logic. Any logic has a set of primitives. Um, and I have a list of these here. See this jump to cell, jump to next cell, jump to random empty cell. Um, by the way, this should have a, um, this should have a, to be consistent, it should have one of these things right after it. In other words, it doesn't take any, any things. It just jumps to a randomly selected with uniform probability empty cell, and it returns false if no empty cell can be located. So um, here, move to next cell requires the destination cell to be unoccupied. And this, pre this is a precondition here as well. Uh, the destination cell is unoccupied. So you can only move to, to cells that are unoccupied. So here, um, we're going to be, uh, for, for, our, for ours, we're going to be adding some, some parameters. But right now, it's 30% chance. If you're not satisfied, you're going to jump to a random empty cell. And, uh, and just as David said, uh, really, this satisfaction criteria is based on this threshold and so some threshold as specified by main and the number of neighbors that are of the same color as, color as, as this cell. So um, here's a number of neighbors that we have. Um, for most cells, because we're in a more neighborhood, we have how many neighbors? We have four neighbors. And then that it multiplies this threshold by this. So maybe the threshold is 76%, 77%, or whatever. But we're only satisfied if the number that are the same color as us, which is either going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, is, um, is greater than or equal to the threshold times these, the total number of neighbors we have which can be no more than four, okay? So really, it's a very coarse-grained thing. This threshold within broad ranges, you know, it's not going to change sort of the, the likelihood that, or the value as to whether this or not is greater than it. Because n same is going to be zero. Here, it's just going to be zero, one, two, three, or four. And the threshold is going to be times four. So it's going to, all that really matters is it's kind of integer. Uh, integer comparison. Anyway, so that's uh, that's how that works. So first they determine are they satisfied, and then based on that they determine. Uh, th then they determine if they're going to jump, they're going to move. And every time it's every step, it's rerunning this logic. And so someone may jump many many times before they settle down into a place they're comfortable with. Or indeed, they may never settle down because they're just constantly jumping because their threshold is just too high for them to be satisfied. Because after all, they may jump to a place they're satisfied with, but one of the neighbors then jumps away. Mm -hmm. And then, then they have to start their search again because the next time through, they won't be satisfied. OK? OK, um, I unfortunately will need to uh, move on to a conference call. What's that? Yes, to make it consistent. Yeah, I know. So I was thinking the same thing. Okay, so let's let's do that right now.
So um, this should be the same as this one, right? Yeah. <laughs> good, good eye, good eye. Okay. Um,